In this video, I'll show you how to write a real-time notch filter in C on an STM32 microcontroller to do some real-time digital audio processing for the electric guitar. We'll have a brief recap of the previous video, which gave us an introduction to the hardware platform and how we set up the main code, and also looking at basic low and high pass filters. I also have a video on my channel detailing the digital notch filter and all the theory, and I'll do a brief recap in this video. Then we'll go straight over to filter implementation, we will implement a real-time variable notch filter in C on an STM32 microcontroller. Lastly, we'll do two demos, one as a system analysis and test doing frequency response and time domain analysis using a digital ADP3450 mixed signal oscilloscope and function generator. Then I'll also plug my guitar into our effects unit and see how this notch filter sounds and what effects we can get from it. Before continuing with this video, I'd urge you to look at my digital audio processing with STM32 video number one, which gives you an introduction and tells you about low and high pass filters and how we set up the basic code structure for our hardware. And this is the hardware we'll be using. This is a custom PCB featuring an STM32 F4 microcontroller, an audio codec, so analog to digital converters and digital to analog converters, some analog front end circuitry, and I've hooked this up in a guitar pedal enclosure with various control inputs, so various potentiometers to set filter settings, for example, foot switches, input jack, and output jack. And I'll be using this to make some guitar-based digital audio effects. Thank you very much to JLC PCB for sponsoring this video. I had these mixed signal audio PCBs, which are featured in this effects unit and this series, manufactured and assembled by them. If you'd like to have similar boards manufactured, you can go to my GitHub repository at github.com forward slash PMS67 and navigate to the LUD DSP audio system on module. This contains an STM32 H7 as well as an audio codec, and you can design your own daughter boards for this. And I've made a previous video on my channel telling you how this system on module is made. All the necessary manufacturing files are also in the repository, and this is all you need to upload to JLC PCB to get them assembled and manufactured. As usual, a huge thank you also to Altium for sponsoring this video. The Le DSPU audio system on module was actually designed using Altium Designer, and they're offering a free trial, which you can find under altium.com forward slash yt forward slash Phil's lab. Using this free trial and clicking on this link really helps me out, so I really appreciate all your support. As before from the previous video, here's a basic overview of the system. We have analog and digital power supplies, feeding the processor, which has a USB connection, serial wire debug programming, various controls, so potentiometers and switches, which are read in via the processor's ADC. We have this codec, which are ADCs and DACs, streaming the data via I2S. Then of course we need some sort of analog front ends, basically as impedance conversion and anti-aliasing filters, and we have a guitar input and an amplifier output. Now let's have a brief recap of notch filter theory. I have a video on my channel called Notch Filters, which tells you what a notch filter is, how it works, how we derive it, and then how we implement it in the C programming language. And we'll pretty much be using this theory and this software implementation for implementation today and see how that sounds on an audio system and how we can vary it. Here are some notch filter basics. Essentially, it's a type of analog or digital filter with the frequency responses shown over here. So we have a flat passband over here and over here, and at some center frequency, we have essentially infinite attenuation at that single frequency and strong attenuation on the sidebands over here. And this is really useful if we want to, for example, cut out a certain frequency. So for example, we might have to filter out 50 or 60 hertz power supply noise. We might want to suppress motor vibrations. And for our case, for audio, we might want to use this for equalizers because we can either use this as a cut or as a boost to boost or cut certain frequencies. And this is actually quite commonly found in guitar pedals known as wah-wahs. As usual, we start off with an analog prototype to derive our differential equation, which we then need to discretize and turn into a difference equation, which you can implement in software. So a notch filter is actually an IRC circuit in the analog domain. We have a resistor, and essentially this potential divider formed by this resistor, and an inductor and capacitor in series. We place the input here before the resistor, and take the output at the other side of the resistor. Then again, we can use equal currents going through the resistor and inducted capacitor, substitute for resistances and reactances, and we get this following transfer function. We can rearrange this a tiny bit and put it into standard form, and we see we have two filter parameters. One is omega naught, which is the center of the notch, and this is in radians per second, which is an angular frequency rather than in hertz, and we have a width of a notch, which is omega w. So for a given center frequency of 50 hertz, we have two different notch widths shown here. On the left-hand side, we have a 5 hertz notch width, and you can see it's a very narrow band that is actually attenuated, but with the wider notch width, we increase this band and let more frequencies through around that center frequency. Once we have our differential equation or our transfer function, we need to discretize it, and I've shown this in many other videos. 
And in effect, we then get this discrete time difference equation with constant coefficients. And this is really nice. So we have our output, which is y sub n, and n denotes the nth sample. So it looks like we need to store two previous output samples, xn being the current input sample, and we need to store the two previous input samples. So this digital notch filter turns out to be a second order filter, which makes sense since we have one inductor and one capacitor. The coefficients alpha and beta I've simplified by substituting with these terms up here. And again, please see my notch filter video for further description. Again, from the notch filter video, we also need to do pre-warping because I have used the Tustin method to discretize this transfer function. And there is again more of that in the notch filter video. Essentially, we have to pre-warp our center frequency using this formula. And I'll show you how to do that in the code as well. So now we're pretty much ready to move over to stm 32 cubide and use the code we have from the notch filter video to implement a variable notch filter. Remember also that we want to make our notch filter variable, so we will choose the controls on this guitar effects pedal, one for the center frequency and one for the notch width, and then one for the volume control. And here we are now in stm 32 cubide and from the previous digital audio processing with STM32 video, you have seen the basic code structure, that we have our main processing function, we set up the codec, we set up our filters and so forth. So in our main processing function, we loop through our input array. We only use the left input because this is a mono system. And then we compute our new output sample and pass that to the output buffer. And this is transferred via DMA and I squared S to the codec. So the actual interesting things for us now are to look at the notch filter implementation functions. And again, this is pretty much taken directly from the notch filter video. And I'd really encourage you to watch that. In essence, and as usual with my implementations, this is a bit crude for now, but this is to prove the main point and how to implement a notch filter. We have a struct containing the sampling frequency. In our case, this will be 48 kilohertz. The filter coefficients you saw from the discrete time difference equation are input array, and this has a length three, because remember we have xn, xn minus one, and xn minus two to store, as well as our output array. Again, with yn, yn minus one, and yn minus two. I could also do this with arrays of length two for X and Y, but just to show the principle, I've kept a length three array. As usual, we have an initialization function, which computes our filter coefficients, set the sampling frequency, and clears our input output arrays. Then because we want to make this filter variable, I've created two new functions. One is to set the center frequency, and this essentially recomputes the filter coefficients for a given center frequency. And this one over here, which is set notch width, which also recomputes the filter coefficients depending on the knot which we selected. The most interesting function, so to speak, is this notch filter update function, which takes in our raw input data and gives us a floating point output, the current value of our filter. I'm sorry for saying this so often, but a lot of this information or most of it is already contained in the notch filter video. The notch filter initialization function stores the sampling frequency, computes the coefficients by calling our functions, and clears the input and output arrays. The set center frequency function essentially converts our center frequency in hertz to an angular frequency. And the way we do that is multiply by 2 pi. Then because I've used the Tustin transform to discretize my continuous time system, I need to pre-walk the center frequency, otherwise my center frequency won't match between my analog and digital domains. And I've just used the formula we saw in the slides. Then I can pre-compute my filter coefficient, and I'm doing that so I don't have to, on every update step, do this computation. So I save a bit of time. Something similar for the notch width, I'm converting my filter frequency to angular frequency and computing my filter coefficient. Now, most interestingly, this is the update function. I take in my input sample and I give a processed output. So first of all, I have to shift my samples, shifting my input samples and shifting my output samples because I will be using these in my output sample calculation. Then I store my newest input sample at x0. This will be xn, so to speak, and that's just my input. Then I simply implement the difference equation we saw in the slides. So all of this text here is simply this difference equation implemented. So I compute this side, I subtract these two yn minus one and yn minus two terms, and I divide by alpha plus beta to give my latest output sample. Once I've done that computation, I can simply return the filtered output. So all we need to do then in main.c is include our notch filter. We've defined our sample rate. We've defined our notch filter struct. In our main function, we've initialized the effects, and this is just nominal values because we'll be making them variable. Then of course, we start the I squared S streams, which will then give us callbacks when we can process the data. The process data callback is process half, and this is called by the DMA. And again, all we have to do is take the left input sample, which is our mono input, and set our output sample by using this notch filter underscore update function with our left input sample. And that's all there is to it. Now I also have an ADC on the STM32 F4 microcontroller, and this is a pretty slow ADC at about 100 hertz. We're sampling 100 times per second, and these are the potentiometers 
which I've hooked up to my guitar effects pedal. And I said before we want to make this filter variable, I've applied a small deadband to see, okay, only if we've changed the control by about 10%, I'm going to update my settings. So the settings aren't updated all the time, I don't have to always recompute my filter coefficients. So one of my potentiometers is to set the notch width. My control setting goes between 0 and 1 effectively, so I go from 50 up to 1050 as my notch width. And of course you can make this however you want. Then I simply call my set notch width update function, and that's all there is to it. My second control is my output volume control to control the overall level that's coming out of my system. And then the third control is simply to set the notch center frequency. And this has a minimum of 100 hertz and can go up to 10,100 hertz. Again, calling my set center frequency. And that's all there is to it. So now we can upload the code and use the waveform software from Digilent to check the frequency response and time domain behavior of this filter. This is the test setup that I'm using. You can see the GDSP system in here on this foot pedal is connected up to my Analog Discovery Pro from Digilent, which has four oscilloscope channels and two function generator channels. So I'm using one of the function generator channels to feed in an input like a test signal, and then two oscilloscope channels to measure the input signal, and then the output from my effects unit. In front of my effects unit, you can see I have an on off switch, which is typically a foot switch. And I have three potentiometers, which will be used as a volume control and also to vary the filter properties. This is all being powered by this nine volt power supply. And I'll be plugging my guitar into this, but I also have an output from this pedal, which goes right into this Steinberg USB audio interface, and that we can just monitor the guitar sound on the computer. I've hooked up the SM32 microcontroller via serial wire debug with my ST-Link version 2, and that's connected via USB to my host computer. I'll be using this Analog Discovery Pro, which was very kindly sent to me by Digilent, for my test setup. So I have four channels of essentially oscilloscope, two channels of function generator, and this has various other goodies which we'll probably explore in future videos. The free software that runs on your host computer, which connects to the Analog Discovery Pro, is this waveform software, and I believe this runs on Mac, Windows, and Linux. We have various functions on the left here, so we have an oscilloscope, function generator, as well as this network analyzer, which we'll be using in just a second. I have the code uploaded to my SM32F4 microcontroller. I have all the signals hooked up, as you just saw in the video and I can click on my network analyzer to perform a frequency response analysis. So I click on network, I can set my start frequency to 200 hertz, stop to 20 kilohertz, so approximately the audio range we're interested in. I'm using channel two, which is my output, and I'm using a 10 times probe. I'm not really interested in the phase, so I've deselected that, and I can click on single to run a single measurement. I'm just gonna center the potentiometer, so I'm gonna center the potentiometer for, for center frequency and notch width. So I've changed my start frequency to one kilohertz, stop frequency to 20 kilohertz because my notch is somewhere between four and five kilohertz according to these potentiometer settings. As we saw from the frequency response, we have a flat passband over here and to the right side of the notch. However, we have this notch in the center with about minus 30 dB of attenuation. So you can really see the difference between theory and practice because we don't really have infinite attenuation here. And this is to do with a discretization, to do with the way we handle the numbers and have the floating point, loss of precision and so forth. So now let's test the variability of this filter. I'm gonna change the center frequency to the left and rerun the measurement. Okay, so I've moved the potentiometer slightly counterclockwise, so reducing my center frequency. As you can see, it's moved from about 4.5 kilohertz to something like 2.4-ish kilohertz over here. So it looks like we can vary our center frequency, which is really pretty good. So let me just keep this potentiometer value the same and vary the notch width and then rerun my measurements. So by rotating my potentiometer all the way clockwise, this is the one for the notch width, you can see I have a much wider notch over here. Now similarly, I can turn it completely counterclockwise and we can see the results. So with the potentiometer completely counterclockwise, that is the one for the notch width, you can see we have a much smaller notch but also far less attenuation with about minus 15 or 16 decibels instead. So now we've looked at the frequency response and verified, okay, we have a notch filter that seems to be doing its thing and seems to be variable in both in terms of center frequency and notch widths. Let's go over to the time domain and see this filter in action. To look at time domain behavior, we'll use the wave generator. So my input is connected to the wave function output one, and I can generate, for example, a one kilohertz sine wave with a certain amplitude. So I'll click run. And then I want to visualize that in the time domain and I can click on scope. Here we have the oscilloscope view and the yellow channel is the input and the blue channel is the output. I have my one kilohertz sine wave being generated and my effect is on. So I have my potentiometer for the center frequency far counterclockwise 
So this is far below one kilohertz and we basically don't get any attenuation. We get a small phase shift and this is due to the filter phase shift as well as the processing time we require. So as I slowly increase my center frequency, you can see, I won't get it exactly, but you can see more and more of this signal as attenuated because I'm increasing my center frequency to approximately one kilohertz and I get quite a lot of attenuation. And then I move it past the center frequency. So I move the center frequency, I know, to two, four kilohertz. And again, because this one kilohertz is outside of this band, I don't get very much attenuation, if any at all. So I can move back my center frequency to be approximately one kilohertz like so, and then I can play around with my notch width. So I'm increasing my notch width, and you can see I'm getting more and more attenuation, or I'm decreasing my notch width, and yeah, I'm getting less and less attenuation because it's just outside of the band. So this looks like it's working, and again, another good way of verifying that this notch filter is doing what it's supposed to. So now that we've verified that, we can plug in a guitar and see how this notch filter actually affects the sound of our instrument.